Yes, just we will go live in a moment. A very good afternoon to everyone here. Uh, respected Dr. Bal Subramanian, Professor Grover, Professor Arvind, Professor Pinaki Madhyumdar, and other senior faculty members of uh, HBNI, and students and other participants. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on application of mathematics to cryptology. And we will hear from one of uh, very revered mathematicians in the country, Professor Balasubramanian. Uh, I will request my colleague, uh, Professor P.D. Nayak, Dean HBNI, to introduce uh, Professor Balasubramanian formally. Before that, I just want to share a, just a few thoughts uh, on this subject. Uh, in the, I, I was reading with interest that uh, as early as 17th century, the great scientist and mathematician uh, Galileo, he noted, he talked about uh, the beauty of mathematics. He said that the book of nature cannot be understood unless one first learns to comprehend the language and read the characters in which it's written. Then he says the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. And its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures, without which it's not humanly possible to understand a single word of it. Well, a very, very poetic way of uh, uh, putting uh, something about mathematics. But then subsequently, uh, Friedrich Gauss, who is very well known as a great mathematician, he also added that mathematics is the queen of sciences, and he added the number theory is the queen of mathematics. Well, I don't know, there will be a lot of discussions on this subsequently. But I know that a good knowledge of uh, mathematics is a great boon for scientists as well as engineers in their endeavors. We know, for example, dealing with several programs in HBNI itself about computational biology that forms a strong interface between mathematics and biology. So an, inter an appreciation of mathematics from the biologists would always definitely be of great benefit to mathematics and vice versa. Similarly, we have interface between mathematics and several other subjects. And uh, we know, for example, that the Monte Carlo simulation, a, math a very classical mathematical technique, has been an extremely valuable approach for gaining insight into very complex neutron transport problems for the nuclear reactors. So we know the importance of mathematics, and uh, it has been a feeling uh, here, uh, in HBNI that we should propagate this among the students in various disciplines uh, in HBNI, and that was the idea of... Uh, uh, having this program, and we had earlier a, a lecture also by Professor Ram Murthy uh, on the on, on the occasion of uh, Ramanujam Centenary. Uh, we have under under, uh, under the fold of HBNI several institutions which are specialists in mathematical sciences, and particularly HRI and IMSC. And I strongly believe that there is a large scope for collaboration uh, between such institutions with others. And it is important for that, that our students across HBNI appreciate the power of mathematics and its applications in various domains. And today's lecture is an effort in, to make that happen. And I do wish that we will have more such lectures on mathematics as we go along. And I will be most happy to receive any suggestions on this from either today's speaker or Professor Pinaki Majumdar or Professor Arvin or anyone else for that matter. So with these few words, I request... Uh, Professor P.D. Nayak to introduce the speaker of the day. Professor Nayak. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Vasudevara. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, HBNI webinar. Uh, uh, first of all, I am thankful to Professor Ramachandran Bar Subramanian for accepting our invitations and delivery talk on application of mathematics in cryptography. Professor Balasubramanian is former director, Institute of Mathematics, Chennai. He obtained his B.Sc. and M.Sc. degree from University of Madras and carried out his Ph.D. work at TFR and obtained Ph.D. degree from University of Bombay. After holding various academic positions at TFR, he moved to IMSC and uh, uh, he superintended as a director at IMSC. Uh, Professor Barasubnam is a recipient of many awards. Notable among them is Santi Sarup Bhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology in 1990. The French government ordered national due merit for furthering Indo-French co 
cooperation in the field of mathematics in 2003, Padmasi in 2006, Fellow of the American Mathematical Society in 2012, and many more. Uh, because uh, of time limit, I'm not going to mention uh, any other award like Bill Awards and other things. Uh, may I request uh, Professor Bal Subramaniam to deliver the talk? Sir, stage is for you. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, therefore, you would have seen a lot of application of mathematics in what you are studying, particularly differential equations, which is what you would definitely most of the problems whether you are doing in physics or engineering, and the equation of motion and so on and so forth, and even what they are mentioned about Galileo. And then, of course, the Monte Carlo, as we said. And it is a little surprising that one can probably even use number theory for applications. And that is something which is rather new, which is called a public key cryptography. And this is going to be a basic introduction to what is public key cryptography. And even 50 years ago, Nobody would have thought that number theory would have any practical application at all. When you are looking at the numbers and the adding it, then you are searching. In fact, G.H. Hardy, who has seen the early effects of science during the period of the World War, was happy and proud that his subject has no application whatsoever. Therefore, he said that, okay, I am working in a subject which has no application and I am happy with it. And let me quote. Give it the theory of numbers. Hurry, hurry. Give it the theory of numbers. Sir, may I request that all others mute their mic because we are getting feedback. We would like to listen to Professor Bal Subramanian without hearing any feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah for any practical and obviously honorable purpose, if it could be turned directly to the furtherance of human happiness or the relief of human suffering, as physiology or even chemistry can, then surely neither goes, about whom of course uh, the Vice Chancellor was talking a few minutes back, nor any other mathematician would have been so foolish as to decline or regret such an application. But science works for evil as well as for good. And both those and lesser mathematicians may be justified in rejoicing that there is one science at any rate and that their own, whose very remoteness from ordinary human activities, should keep it gentle and clean. And therefore, Harley would not have probably even expected that in 50 years that his, his uh, subject is going to be used for sending communications and the first of all what is cryptography because this is a word which probably most of you would have known but it, uh, let me still define it this is a way of sending message securely through an insecure channel that's basically the thing i mean you are sending a message and you always know that it can be tapped and uh, then Therefore, the channel is insecure and you do not want the person who is tapping the message to understand what the message contains. Therefore, let me explain. Suppose Alice wants to send a message to Bob. She knows that Oscar will be tapping the message and she does not want Oscar to understand the contents. And that's exactly where the cryptology comes. Therefore, she encodes the message. And in the encoded message, of course, Oscar cannot understand. She encodes a message and sends it to Bob. Even if Oscar taps a message, he will not be able to understand the content. That's all what cryptology was all about. Classically, the encoding consisted of only two operations. One, which is called the key addition, 
Suppose you consider the English alphabets as representing numbers. A stands for 0, B stands for 1, C stands for 2, D stands for 3. And if 3 is the key, then you are adding 3 to every element. Then A will go to D because A is 0 and D is 3 and you are adding 3. And B will go to E, C will go to F and so on and so forth. Thus, if the message is HP and 9, Alice will send it K, E, Q, L because H will go to K and B will go to E, N will go to Q and I will go to L. And unless Oscar knows the key, which is 3 in this case, Oscar cannot decide. This is the thing. Therefore, you just take the message and add a key to that. And once you add the key, and if the person who is tapping the message he does not know the key, then there is no way that the person would be able to see what the message is. We if whatever we said, we let us rephrase in the computer age which means now the, our message is not an English word or even English abbreviation like HBNI or our messages would be just numbers, okay. Therefore, let the message be a 4-bit number, okay. And then the key is again another 4-bit number and then you do the addition, 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 and then is equal to 1, 1 plus 1 is equal to 0. Therefore, the 1, 0, 0, 0, suppose that is the message and you add the key 1, 1, 0, 1 and then you get 0, 1, 0, 0 and that is what you are saying. And this I am going to do throughout this lecture. That is, I am going to assume that my message is a, a number, an integer which is written in binary. That is all what I will always assume. And particularly since we plan to use the computer, I mean that will, that will be very helpful for us if all the messages. And of course, you most of you know how to make a message which is an English uh, sentence to numbers and then how to revert back and take the number and make it as an English sentence. Now the next is permutation. That is, you just take the same letters and permute them. Okay, HBNI, Alice sends the NHIB for example. Then there is no way the other person would know. Surprising as it may seem, it is very interesting, it is possible to construct crypto system based only on key addition and the permutation, which are very secure, as long as the keys are not revealed. Therefore, one, unless you know the key, then you cannot do it at the systems. I mean, you may think that the whole thing is should be very easy to reverse because that's a key addition and the permutation and then you have to do a few uh, trial and error. But the fact is that it is not so. There are some, you can put some yes boxes and so on and so forth. And you can make it very complicated. And this is what is called a symmetry key. And uh, since I don't plan to talk about the symmetry key, I want to plan to talk about the asymmetry key. And this is all what I would say about this. The, what is an asymmetry key? I mean, why is the system not very safe? But the system has some disadvantages and there are various disadvantages which one can enumerate on this system. But now we will give one simple example. Suppose there are some hundred people working in an office. There are hundred people are working in an office. And suppose we insist in order that the files are confidential, that every pair of person should communicate through encoded message only. Therefore, if every pair Therefore, if there are O1, O2, O3 or the 100 people, then O3 ha can communicate with O7 only through coded messages. O8 can co communicate with O5 only with coded messages. Then, every pair of person O8, O8, they have to agree on certain key, EIJ, DIJ, let us say, E for encoding and D for decoding. The key is, at least at this stage, is either the permutation or the addition of the thing. And what is the number which you are adding and which is the permutation that you are using? That's what is the key is. The pair of keys which O1 and O2 are using should not be known to the person O3. Because then there is really no thing, whatever O1 sends to O2, O3 would be able to get it. And therefore, the number of keys for that was once you know that every pair of people should have a key, then if there are hundred people, then the number of keys is 100 choose 2 for every pair, which is something like a 4,920. And then the key management becomes a very difficult problem. 
with so many keys and then again if one of the person resigns and then another person joins etc that reshuffling and that is going to be a much more difficult i mean this key management is one of the things in cryptology which is rather well studied and this and that still has very interesting properties and this is where the asymmetric key also called as the public key games therefore i should know what the asymmetric key is suppose we have a crypto suppose we have a crypto system where even if one knows the encoding key it is not possible to find the decoding key i mean at the first step you will think that such a system cannot exist because once i know how you are encoding i am going to only reverse it and if i reverse it then i am going to get the d and what should be so difficult if i know the encoding key why can't i get the decoding and we are actually going to see some examples like that where even if you know the encoding key it is not possible to get the decoding in that case then i don't need this very key 4950 keys i can actually manage with the less number of keys in such a scenario y1 constructs a pair of key y1 constructs a pair of key there's no now consultation between y1 and y2 or y1 and y3 y1 himself constructs a pair of keys y1 and y1 he makes y1 to be public and keeps d1 with himself therefore the encoding key has to y1 has been made public the decoding key is only with y1 and really so even if the idea of person knows the encoding key e1 he cannot find out the decoding key d1 and therefore the d1 only y1 has nobody else has the encoding key e1 is what everybody has if anybody y wants to send a message to y1 then y uses the e1 to encode the message anybody who want therefore the y e1 is the encoding message for y encoding key for y1 anybody who wants to send a message to y1 can always use this encoding key e1 and then y1 would be able to decode the message but nobody else would be able to decode the message since any other y j does not know d1 we see y j cannot decode the message similarly so y2 construct a pair e2 uh, d2 y3 construct some e3 d3 thus the number of key pairs needed is just 100 each one by himself Makes a pair of keys, and then he keeps the encoding, the encoding part public, and the decoding part he keeps to himself. And once the decoding part is kept to himself, and that key can be used by anybody to send the message to. And this is something which you cannot do in the symmetric key, because once the key encoding key is known, then essentially the decoding key can be easily done. therefore the asymmetric key is what gains and this asymmetric key is essentially done using number theory and that's a number theory which we plan to look at little carefully the first example of an asymmetric key was given by phil diffie and martin helman in 1976 and that was first of all there were, i think there were some problems with the government us government and the mathematics was also somewhat uh, difficult and therefore that didn't become that famous at that time at least then in 1978 reverse shamir and adraman get another crypto system which we shall discuss in detail i mean therefore the whole, whole the rest of the things i am going to discuss what rsa is which means this is a system which i am claiming where it is even if a person knows the encoding key then he cannot find out the decoding key and consequently i mean this system is very safe good therefore this of course involves a certain number theory and uh, therefore let me do some little number theory and then we'll say how to uh, how this rsa is constructed therefore some number theory we define p to be a prime number if it is divisible by only by 1 and p for example 2 3 5 7 etc are the prime numbers and it's a celebrated theorem of euclid 
But there are infinitely many prime numbers. Suppose if you really want prime numbers, they are there. There is no dearth of prime numbers. There are really lots and lots of prime numbers. And in fact, the prime number theorem states that the number of primes less than n is around n over log n. But those many primes are there. And this logarithm is really a logarithm to the base d. Now that it would make a dip uh, much a difference because the constant will change, but other than that, it's no problem. Therefore, there are really lot of primes. Up to n, there are really n over log n primes. And now we want to define something called the congruence. We say that A is congruent to B modulo M. It is read as A is congruent to B modulo M if M divides A minus B. And for example, 22 is 12 mod 5 because 5 divides the difference 22 minus 12. And 43 equal to minus 6 mod 7 because 7 divides the difference between 43 and minus 6 which is 49. And 25 is not congruent to 2 mod 11 because the 11 does not divide the difference between 25 and 2. The advantage of this notation, this notation is essentially due to Gauss. And Gauss was trying to prove something called the quadratic reciprocity law. And then he, he needed this notation to really do the quadratic reciprocity. The advantage of this notation is that the congruences can be handled like equalities. What does that mean? That if A is congruent to B modulo M, then for any integer C, C A is congruent to C B modulo M. Which means that if you are given A congruent to B modulo M, you can multiply by C. You can raise it to any power. That is, if A is congruent to B modulo M, then A power J is congruent to B power J modulo M. Now you can raise it to any power. And in fact, if you take any polynomial Px with integer coefficients, then P of, P of A is congruent to P of B modulo M. So this congruence is rather important for us. This means when you write A is congruent to B modulo M, I simply mean that M divides A minus B. That's all. And then you that the point is that these congruences can be handled as normally you will handle the equality. Also, if A is congruent to B bond row M and B is congruent to C bond row M, then A is congruent to C bond row M. This is what is called as the transitivity. The so once you have. And if A is congruent to B bond row M, C is congruent to D bond row M, then you can add A plus C is congruent to B plus D bond row M. The whole point which I am now trying to explain is that if this can, congruences are not easy to handle and they can, you can essentially handle them as you handle equalities. There may be some problems with the division. If K is congruent to KB bond row M, then this need not always imply A congruent to B bond row M, but we can forget. Okay. Now, what do we want to do? There was a word theorem which was proved by Fermat, which is called the Fermat Fitzhugh theorem, and this theorem they want to state. A power P congruent to A modulo P. This is true for every A and every P. Any integer A and any prime P, if you take, then A power P is congruent to A modulo P, which is the same as saying that if you take a power p minus a, that number is divisible by p. For example, let me give some example. 2 power 5 is 2 modulo 5 because 2 power 5 is 32 and 32 minus 2 is divisible by 5. And 2 power 11 is congruent to 2 modulo 11 because 2 power 11 is 2048. And when you subtract 2046, then you will get that, that 2046 is divisible by 11. And 3 power 7 is congruent to 3 modulo 7, which I will need you to check. That when you take 3 raised to the power 7, and I mean, when I say about 3 raised to the power 7, I am going to make some comments a little later, is congruent to 3 modulo 7. But this is not the theorem which we are interested. This theorem of the FEMA was generalized by Euler, and that theorem of Euler is what we are interested in. Theorem of Euler says, I mean, Perma was talking about one prime p, and the theorem of Euler talks about two primes p and q. And the theorem of Euler says that if a is co prime to pq, it means that a and pq do not have a common factor, 
then if you define n to be p times q and phi of n to be p minus 1 times q minus 1, then a power phi n is congruent to 1 modulo n. Okay. For example, if you take p equal to 3 and q equal to 5 and n equal to 15, then phi n equal to 8 and then this says that 2 power 8 is congruent to 1 modulo 15 because 2 and 15 are co-prime. And, uh, and what is 2 power 8 is 256 minus 1 is 255 and 255 is this will be 50. Therefore, this is this is a theorem that you want. That the theorem of Euler says that if you take n to be product of two primes p and q and you define your n to be p q and p n to be p minus 1 and q minus 1, then f power p n is congruent to one one of n. Ah, now I want to say something about the polynomial time algorithm. This is something which is probably the students and computer science will be doing daily and uh, this being somewhat a mass lecture i am not even going to define properly what the parliament time algorithm means but suffice to say that these algorithms take less time for implementation therefore if you have an algorithm and you have only learned therefore for obtaining the results and hence useful in practice therefore whenever you have an algorithm you want to see whether it's a parliament time algorithm then you can use it because then you can do the problems quickly and if it's not a polynomial time algorithm, like an exponential time algorithm type thing, which you are having from problems like a traveling salesman's problem, then probably you would not like to use those algorithms. And we give a few examples. If you are given two integers and if you want to compute the GCD, then there's something called a Euclid's algorithm. And this Euclid's algorithm to compute the GCD is really a polynomial time algorithm, which means that computing GCD is very easy. And the exponentiation, given 3a, a, n and m, computation of f over m modulo m is polynomial time algorithm and that's first of all that is not even obvious because if I have given something like a 2 power 53 modulo 79, then you have to take 2 raised to the power 53 that already takes 53 operations and then divide by 79 and uh, probably for 2 power 53 your computer may not even have a storage space. Therefore, there are trick problems. But that's, you don't use the naive algorithms, there are definitely better algorithms and the better algorithms would allow you to compute actually to a power n modulo m in polynomial time. And also, if a and m are co-prime, then finding an x such that a is congruent to 1 modulo m, this is called the inverting the a and that's a polynomial time algorithm. Okay, why do I need all those things? Because now I am going to explain what is this RSA grid process. <laughs> and therefore, there are two, two things which I would say. First of all, what is the system? And number two, I mean, that is, I have to prove that the system really works. And number three, which is the most important, that it is an asymmetric key, which means that even if the intruder knows the encoding key, he will not be able to get the decoding. And uh, let's do that. Once we do that, then you have already a system with you, which is very safe. Even if you know the coding, your coding, you cannot decode. Suppose Bob wants to send a message M to allies. We assume that the messages are converted to numbers. Therefore, the message M is always an M bit number in binary. And you may say that, okay, the message may be bigger, whatever. Then that's not a very serious problem. If the message is bigger, you can always partition into m bit numbers. Therefore, always we will assume, and if suppose it is less than m, then you can add zeros to that. And therefore, we can always assume that a message is an m bit number. And this message which is an m bit number is what we want to send. Now, before Bob sends a message to Alice, what Alice does? Alice takes two prime numbers p and q, both bigger than m. And she defines the n to be pq, which is exactly what we did earlier, and defined phi n to be p minus 1, q minus 1. And choose an integer e, which is co prime to phi n, and that will be the encoding key. And then she inverts the encoding key to modulo phi n, which means that she computes a d such that e d congruent to 1 modulo phi n, and this d is the decoding key, and she makes the encoding key public. She keeps the decoding key 
key to herself and destroys the original two primes P and Q. This is the setup. As we say earlier, the encoding key is always made public. Everybody has the encoding key, and uh, but the decoding key is kept only with that person. And since bar allies, that's exactly what allies does. Therefore, allies takes two primes P and Q, and she defines the n to be P times Q and phi n to be p minus 1 times q minus 1 and then choose an integer a e which is the encoding key and it computes the corresponding decoding key. The decoding key is essentially the inverse of e as to be expected because once you have the encoding key you have to invert it and only then you will get the decoding key and the decoding key is such that e d congruent to one model of e n and she makes e n and public and it keeps d to herself and destroys p. In order to send this message m, Bob computes m power e modulo n. Therefore, what Bob does is that he takes a message rises to the power e modulo n. He takes a message m rises to the power e modulo n and then he gets a c and then sends a quadrant message c. The first thing which you want to see is that in order to send the message, whatever material that is needed is already with the Bob. What does he need? He needs the E and Alex has already put the E in the public domain and Alex has already put the N also in the public domain. Therefore, E is in the public domain, N is a public domain and therefore it is very easy for Bob to really compute M power E mod rho L because whatever that he needs, he computes. Remember, P and Q are destroyed and therefore nobody has P and Q, including Alex, nobody has P and Q and therefore whatever system which I am whatever algorithm which I am writing, that should not involve P and Q. And, uh, but, and uh, for Bob, the parameters are only precisely those parameters which are in the public domain. And since E and N are in the public domain, Bob can compute M power E mod rho N and that gives you C. And sends that quadrant message to C. Now, Alice computes c power d mod rho n and gets m. The, what Alice does, she takes the c which has come from Bob, rises to the power d mod rho n and she gets that value m. And now there are two questions which you have to answer. Now let us look at this question. First question, in this process will Alice get the correct message m? You know, unless Alice gives the correct message m, there's really no point. I mean, you don't want to have a crypto system where you are not able to decrypt the things because it is correct. Okay, let's see why is that true. First of all, what does Alice? Alice has received the C from Bob and then she takes that C. Yeah. Alice has received C from Bob and, uh, and the C was M power E. I mean, that's exactly because uh, Bob has taken the M, rises to the power E, and then he gets a C, and that C is what she is getting. And now this C she is rising again to the power D. Now you have to only say that first rising to the power C and then rising to the power D, you get the original message. In other words, rising to the power C and then rising to the power D is the inverse of each other. That is why is that true? When you rise into the power D, then the c power d becomes m power e d modulo n. But e d was chosen to be yeah, e d was chosen to be 1 modulo of e n. Which means what? e d minus 1 is divisible by phi n. e d minus 1 is divisible by phi n means e d minus 1 is called some k times phi n. And that's exactly what I am writing. e d is equal to 1 plus k times phi n. Therefore, this I can write as m, and then you have an m power phi n. You have an m, and then you have an m power phi n raised to the power k. And now I can use Euler's theorem. Euler's theorem is a statement which says that m power phi n is equal to 1 mod rho n. Yeah. That's Euler's theorem. It will say, m power phi n equal to 1 mod rho n for n e and therefore in particular m power phi n equal to 1 mod rho n and therefore therefore what you get is finally your c power d 
is m times 1 power k which is m mod rho n. Therefore, Alice is able to compute it and she gets the correct message here. And remember, in all this process, what the both the uh, both the coding as well as the encoding is just the exponential action. That's all what we are doing. I mean, as far as Bob is concerned, Bob takes a m and exponentiates e power e mod rho m. And as far as Alex is concerned, she takes a c exponentiates to the power d mod rho m. And we have seen that both are polynomial time algorithms. That's very important. Both are polynomial time algorithms and consequently it is easy. Of course, still one should say that this is not as easy as a symmetric key, but that's a different point. We will not bother about it. And now finally, we ask the final question. Given E and N, which means E and N are in the public domain and uh, E is the encoding key, Therefore, once the E and the N are the encoding key and if they are in the public domain, why can't Oscar get the decoding key? Because I am now claiming that this is really an asymmetric key. This is really an asymmetric key means that even if Oscar knows the coding key, he cannot find out the decoding key. And why can't he do that? I mean, how did we find the decoding key? which Oscar cannot do. What is the information which we had, which Oscar does not have? Okay, therefore let's go back to this question. How did Alice get that? Recall, she starts with the two prime numbers P and Q, computes N, which is PQ, and computes phi N, which is P minus 1, Q minus 1, and solves that equation to get D. And to one of us, Oscar also can do the same thing. Whatever Alice did for getting the D, he can also do the thing. Suppose he knows E and phi n, he can also solve the equation E x equal to 1 mod of phi n. And solving the equation E x equal to 1 mod of phi n, he gets the value of D. Okay, what's the problem? Okay, before that, let me also say that it is believed that this is the only way to get D. In other words, it is believed that you should get the phi n in order to get t. Okay? Now, without knowing phi n, there is no way to get t. I mean, that's what it's believed. And uh, first of all, what helped allies to know the phi n and why Oscar cannot get the phi n? Let's go back. How did the allies get the phi n? Phi n by definition, you see, is p minus 1 into q minus 1. Now, the P and Q are the primes which Alice has started. Since Alice has started with the primes P and Q, it is very easy for her to compute the P n because she has to only multiply P minus 1 into Q minus 1. And once you, she multiplies P minus 1 into Q minus 1, she gets the value of P n. But on the other hand, P and Q are not known to anybody now. It's only the capital N which is known. And from this capital N, you should get the information on P and Q. And having got the information on P and Q, then probably you can get the P N. And once you have the P N, then you can get the value of P. That means essentially Oscar has to factorize the N and to get the P and Q and to compute P. Yes. Now we want to prove that this factorization is not such an easy problem. We want to prove that this factorization is somewhat a time consuming problem and therefore Oscar will not be able to do it. Okay. Since for those who might be seeing this for the first time, this might be a little complicated. Let me just go through what I have done about the RSA just once more. Yeah. RSA algorithm. This essentially allies takes two primes P and Q, computes N, which is PQ, and P N equal to P minus 1, Q minus 1. And she has a uh, he has an encoding key and the decoding key E D, which which is satisfied the relation that E D is congruent to one model of P N. And uh, 
we just saw a few minutes back that if you are given an E and you are given a PN, computing D is also a polynomial item algorithm. And therefore, it is not difficult for Alex to get the D. Therefore, she has the E and she has the D and you get the E D equal to one model of PN. And the, the algorithm is very simple. You take the message, exponentiate it, and that gives you the quadrant message. And uh, Alex takes the quadrant message, exponentiate it, she gets the original message. First, we proved that in fact she will get the original message. That's not the problem. And the second thing which we are now trying to see is Oscar cannot get D. And what we have seen essentially is not getting D is tantamount to getting phi n. But phi n is p minus 1 into q minus 1. And it was easy for allies to get the p minus 1 into q minus 1 because she started with 2 primes p and q. And therefore, getting phi minus 1 into q minus 1 was easy for her. Whereas Oscar has only an information which is E and N and therefore the only way he can do it is to factorize the N and to compute the PN and then he can get the D. Now the final, the final side I want to talk about how difficult is the factorization. Now, finally, it boils down to the question how to factorize the N. The naive algorithm is to check whether p divides n for every prime p up to square root of n. This is what you would have studied in your high school. That in order to factorize n upper n, you take the prime and then check the, the, the prime divides n for every prime which is the square root of n. And suppose Alice takes p and q to be some 30 bit prime numbers. 30 bit prime numbers are essentially you say 10 digit number. 10 digit prime numbers in decimals. That is the 30 bit prime number. Therefore, p will be around 2 power 30, q will be around 2 power 30, and the n is around 2 power 60. And therefore, the square root of n is around 2 power 30. Therefore, now you want to know how many primes are there less than 2 power 30, because you want to take every prime less than square root of n, and then check whether this p divides n. Therefore, square root of n is around 2 power 30. And the number of primes up to 2 power 30 by prime number theorem, as we have seen already, the number of primes up to the n is n over log n, log to the base g. Therefore, 2 power 30 is 2 power 30 divided by 30 log 2, which is a little bigger than 2 power 28. Even assuming that you take one second to check whether the speed divides n, it will take around 2 power 28 seconds to factorize the n, because you have to check with every prime. 2 power 30 and it will take 2 power 28 seconds to factorize here and this 2 power 28, 28 seconds is just a time which is a little more than 8 years. And therefore there is no way uh, 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 Oscar can decode the message. I mean in order to decode the message you have to do one computation namely factorizing the n and if the n is for example around 2 power uh, it's a 30 bit number, 60 bit number, we consisting of two primes which are all 30 bits, then just to decode it, it will take 8 years. And if it were not 30 bit numbers, the primes are from 40 bit or what is normally nowadays used as 128 bit or 256 bits, then you can imagine that there is absolutely no way anybody to factorize the end. But now for the factory session, I just made a point that the one way, the way to do that is to check every, whether every prime divides n for primes up to square root of n. Actually, better algorithms for, for factory sections are known. And uh, they work in what is called as a sub-exponential time, exponential constant time, square root log n time. But still, they are not polynomial time algorithms, which means that they are not less time consuming algorithms. They are still uh, exponential or sub exponential times. And which means in some sense that you, if you are given a number which is probably around uh, 128 bit, then there is absolutely no way it can be factorized. A 128 bit number cannot be factorized probably in 10 years. At least, yeah, this is a small caravan I took there. At least till the advent of quantum computers. Because most of you would have probably studied that these quantum computers are capable of doing all those things. And there are things 
which are called shores algorithms and what not which you would probably be able to factorize the numbers and to those algorithms in quantum computers turn out to be somewhat polynomial time algorithms which means that you can actually do that but that once a quantum computer comes then we will bother about that because at least till that time the rsa is definitely a public key crypto system in the sense that if you are using uh, two prime numbers p and q which are of 128 bit numbers then you can be absolutely sure that even if somebody knows the coding key then there will be no way to do the encoding and now of course you will wonder what happens to the if the quantum computers do come and then of course then you have to do a little more more difficult mathematics to see whether you can find out algorithms which is a quantum computer would not be able to solve in some sense again let me which i probably i should have written which i have not written yes essentially what is it we have done we have we want a coding system and the decoding should be difficult therefore in a simple mathematical language we want a function f which is easy to compute and its inverse function f inverse should be difficult to compute that's all what we want a function f which is easy to compute and the inverse function f inverse which is difficult to compute and such functions are actually called one way functions therefore we will just want the example of a one way function and this rsa gives this one way function namely f is a multiplication and the f inverse is a factorization the f is a map which takes two primes p and q and you maps it to p times q and the f inverse takes the p times q and gives you the two primes p and q therefore f is multiplication and f inverse is factorization and as you can clearly see the multiplication is a polynomial time algorithm which is very easy to do and the factorization is really a time therefore what you finally you need is construction of such a one way function and if you have constructed some one way function and we are sure that this is a one way function but then you are afraid that when the quantum computer comes the quantum computer may be able to do the f inverse in a polynomial time then of course you throw away this system and try to find out another system where the quantum computer will not be able to compute the f inverse in less time and then therefore the race goes on whether the coding and the decoding the race seems to be going on and thank you very much thank you professor balasubramaniam for a very fascinating insight into the subject it was a very complex topic but you explained it so nicely for everyone to understand i am um, sure there will be many questions from the students i hope you can spend some time with us to yeah, answer yeah. some of them so uh, I, we will yes are there any questions from the audience on youtube okay i will i will start with the question sir sir actually uh, at a practical level where are these employed are they being oh, widely employed uh, yes so everywhere there is what is employed you see because in some sense for example when i send a password when i send some yeah, yeah, uh, email to my bank mobile banking and everything is precisely based on the uh, okay not on rsa nowadays but more on electric calls but they are, they are all based upon the asymmetric key but you can't use all this mobile banking or various things using symmetric key at all okay there is one question from mr venkatesh chandragiri how does one understand the relationship between cryptography and blockchain that involves a little too much of cryptography and i don't think i can explain it in 5 minutes the blockchain is a, is a great thing in cryptography but uh, the mathematics involved is a little bit more complicated particularly one need to know something about the elliptic curves and so on so forth any other question rsa is a simplest crypto system and for any other purposes you need crypto systems which are a little stronger than rsa okay 
this uh, when i see for example even social media like facebook i see a statement there end to end encrypted even even whatsapp for example they claim that yeah. it is end to end encrypted yes so is it the same meaning which they convey that what i sent anybody cannot uh, uh, yeah nobody can that's exactly what it means it has been encrypted therefore it cannot be decoded are there any other questions from anybody no i think people are still assimilating whatever you have said and uh, anyway this lecture will be available on the youtube as well and uh, i i am sure that uh, those who see it later if they want to ask any questions they can always uh, write yeah. to you yes and uh, maybe i will once again contact you later after yeah. i have assimilated it to understand this further so thank you very much for uh, sparing your time today and talking to our uh, faculty and students i can say that a good number of them have joined both on webex as well as youtube oh. and uh, all thankful to you for uh, your excellent explanation about uh, this cryptography thank you professor bal subramanian thank you uh, we can close the meeting at this point yeah, yeah. I, uh, yes. okay thank you thank you yes